How many of you are excited about Thanksgiving this week? Who's looking forward to it? Okay, there we go. We got one person really excited. So that's how I feel about Thanksgiving. This is, this is one of my favorite weeks. I love this week. We have a lot of traditions in our house. My wife is awesome at just um, really making everything a tradition. We got traditions with every holiday and birthdays and different things like that. And uh, it all starts on Tuesday night with our praise service. Who's planning on being here Tuesday night for the praise service? I hope you all are 6.30, okay? Not 6, not 7, not 5, 6.30 on Tuesday night, praise service. Um, I always look forward to that service, singing and worshiping with you, and then hearing what God's been doing in your life. And so that's a time for you to come prepared, ready to share some praises about what God's done in your life and in your family this past year. So we start with that, and then Wednesday is a prep day for us and our family. We always host Thanksgiving, so there's a whole lot of prepping to do. And I got to brag for just a minute because I have one specialty when it comes to food in my entire life, and it happens on Thanksgiving. And it's one big area that I'm proud of because I have converted my wife in only one area for her to like something from the north better than the south. And it has to do with dressing or stuffing, okay? Where's all the dressing people? Where's all the stuffing people? Where's all the people that despise the other side? No, just kidding. You shouldn't be despising each other. But I mean, those are the big debates in the South. But I have actually converted her. My specialty is I make stuffing balls and we cover them in gravy. They are so good. Oh, I'll tell you what. I can't wait to eat them. We eat them once a year. That's it. And that's the only specialty in the kitchen that I have. And I'm going to be working so hard doing that while Atlanta does like 19 other things. All right. So um, we prep, and then we get to Thursday morning, and I love Thanksgiving Day. I get up, and I go to Milton Bakery. You can't, I mean, you want to get in the spirit of Thanksgiving. Start at Milton Bakery, all right? That is the place to be. And then I, I used to buy a paper that had all of those Black Friday ads in it. Last year, I was disappointed. I went to buy my paper. It's gone. It's all electronic now. Man, our world is just changing, and it's harder. But we used to get that paper and it has all those Black Friday ads, and then we eat donuts, and the kids start going through, and they like circle what they want for Christmas, and it's just fun. We turn on the Thanksgiving parade, and then it turns into a crazy flurry of work for a while, and then the family shows up, and the food, and all God's people said food, right? Oh, man, the food shows up, and football shows up, and it's just an awesome time. My favorite part of the day, though, is at some point throughout the afternoon, we stop everybody. We try our best to get all the kids quiet. And every single person goes around the table, and we all say something that we're thankful for. And without a doubt, in our family, there's always tears. Somebody, multiple people, always end up crying. And, you know, the whole point that I'm trying to get at is this. We have so much to praise God for, don't we? We have so much to praise Him for. I want to challenge you. Take this entire week. Start today. Just start reflecting on God. Start looking back over your past year. Stop seeing maybe the problems and the battles that you're faced with today and start looking for the goodness of God. And I promise you, it's there. You will be overwhelmed. And there's nothing more important than taking that time to stop and to praise God. Thanksgiving is important because I believe that it, that it ultimately plays a huge role in living a life of thanks living. And that's where we've been for the past five weeks. We're wrapping up our series today. We're finishing up the book of Malachi. And next week, we jump into some Christmas themes and some Christmas topics. And I can't wait to get into that either. But the whole point that we've been talking about here is that God isn't just looking for a day. He doesn't want us just to take the fourth Thursday of the month of November, and that's the day that we give him thanks. He wants us to give him thanks every day. And more importantly than that, he wants us to live a life of thanks living. He's not just looking for a day. And the title of the message that I have for you this morning is this, set your hope in God. Set your hope in God. It ties into the baby dedication. There's some great challenges to all of our young parents and families that were up here today, but set your hope in God. Thanks living will not happen by accident. And I like that word set because you know what it means to set? It means to put or place or lay something. How many of you ladies or how many of you people take a lot of time to set your table for Thanksgiving before everybody shows up? You lay, you put everything in its perfect spot. You have it all set just right. You know what God wants you parents to do with your children and your young families? He wants you to put, to place, to lay 
All of your hopes, all of your dreams, all of your expectations, everything that we want out of this world and everything that we want out of this life, it ought to be centered in him and it ought to be wrapped up in him. Set your hope in God to our church family. I I want this church to be a place where our children grow up and everywhere they look, they look at you and they look at you over here and they look at you over here and all they see wherever they look is they see the goodness of God. They see testimonies of God's faithfulness lived out over and over again. And if that's gonna happen and that's gonna be a reality, all of us, we've gotta put, we've gotta place, we gotta set our hope in God. And that's, I believe that's really the whole point for the book of Malachi. That's the conclusion. That's that's what he's after here. Stop looking for blessings and prosperity and start putting your hope in me and watch how I bless you with blessings and prosperity. So let's dive right into that. I got got three action steps for us this morning if we're going to set our hope in God. Here's number one. Put God to the test. Put God to the test. (laughs) He begins this this conclusion with some awesome reminders. Look at verses six and seven with me of chapter three, okay? Chapter three, verses six and seven. He says this, for I am the Lord. What are the next three words? Everybody out loud together. I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you said, Wherewith shall we return? Several weeks ago when we began the book of Malachi, remember I told you that there was a thousand years of context in this book. You know what that context is? A thousand years of unfaithfulness on the part of God's people. A thousand years of, they just were constantly, no matter how good God was, they're just constantly looking to everyone else and everywhere else for their blessings to come from. They did not set their hope in God. And in spite of the fact, you know what God reminds them of? I am faithful. Can I tell you this morning? God is faithful because he does not change. You know what he says? We are not consumed. Hey, he made a covenant. He knew that that they would be rebellious. He knew that they would fail him. And yet God says, I have been faithful to you all of these years. And it is because of my faithfulness, because I do not change. That's why you're not consumed. And then he also said in verse seven, you want to talk about that? Not only is God faithful, God is merciful. He says, if you return unto me, I will return unto you. In spite of all of the times in their life where they failed God and they walked away from God, God's still there with arms open wide and he's saying, return unto me, return unto me even now and I will return unto you. Hey, it reminds me of what the Bible says in Lamentations chapter three. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed for his compassions fail not. His mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Did you get up today overwhelmed by the mercies of God? Did you know that God's mercy and his goodness met you today? It's meeting you here right now, and it's because of his mercy, and only because of his mercy, that we are not consumed. I mean, you want to talk about setting the context for this passage right here, why we should set our hope in God. God is faithful. God is merciful. And yet the blind ignorance that we see in these people, because they said at the end of verse 7, wherein shall we return? (laughs) You know what they're saying? God's saying, return unto me. And they're like, we're already here, God. That's what they're saying. I mean, we've been offering sacrifices. We worship you. We're crying at the altar. We're mourning and we're weeping and we're begging you, God, bless our lives. What, what, What do you mean return unto us? And look at how God responds to them in verse 8. He says, will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, and wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Man, right off the bat, you know what he does? If you think that that verse is using strong language, you're right. It's using strong language. You know what God's saying? You're robbing me. You're robbing me in my tithes and offerings. You are forcibly taking something away from the owner without his consent. That's what it means to rob somebody. You go up and you take something from somebody that they have not given you permission to take. And God's saying, you're robbing me in my tithes and offerings. A few weeks ago, we were going through the book of Psalms on a Wednesday night. And um, I think it was Psalm 24, verse 1. It opens up with, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You know that God is the owner 
and the creator and the giver and the sustainer of all things, God owns it all. And if he owns it all, he has a right to do with it or to demand of it whatever he wants to do with it, whatever he wants to demand of it. And you know what he asked his people to do? He asked his people to give a tithe. He asked them to give a tenth. That's it. Just give me a tenth of all that I've blessed you with. I want that back. And here he is. He's accusing them of robbing him. Here's, here's the first thing that we need to learn from this. Obedience is key. Obedience is key. I was thinking about the, these children that were going to be up here a lot this week. What's one of the first and most important lessons you teach your children? You teach them to do what? Obey. That's exactly right. And you teach them to obey. Why? Because you love them. You know when that child starts crawling around and they, they get up to an outlet and they, they start putting their fingers in that outlet? How many of you go over there really quickly and are like, get your fingers away, don't ever touch that again? You ever been there with your kids before? Why do you do that? Because you're being mean to your kids? No, because you love your kids. How about when you go to a parking lot or, or you live on a busy street? What do you teach your kids? Don't go near the road. Don't run out in that parking lot. Why do you do that? Because you love your children and you care about them. You know what I promise you is happening in the nursery right now, man? It's going down in the nursery right now, I guarantee you. There's kids in there, some of those beautiful kids that are in there biting each other, hitting each other, stealing their toys. You want your kids to grow up biting, hitting, and stealing as adults? I mean, that would look pretty rough, wouldn't it? I guarantee you. So you know what we do? We teach our kids. Sometimes you can pick up your kids from the nursery and you found out they did something horrific like that. And you go home and you teach them, no, that's not good. Don't do that. You need to obey. You need to do right. We teach our kids this from an early age. Um, the reason why it is like that up on the points over here, O-B-E-D-I-E-N-C. When I was a kid, we learned this song, obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. And then you get to the chorus and you had to spell it out. And you spell it O. B. There you go. Some of you got it. Okay. Some of you still know that one right there. That, that song is ingrained in my head. Whenever I think of obedience, I can't not think of it in that light. So I want you to understand we're talking about giving. God's accusing his people of robbing. And I want you to understand obedience is the key. Now, before I go any further, I, I want you to also understand this. God has good reasons for the tithe. The tithe was used to take care of the priests and the Levites. The priests and the Levites were a special group inside of a special group of people, and their whole responsibility was to remind the people to know God, to walk with God, to help the people to know his laws and his ways, and God wanted them to be supported so that they could, they could dedicate their full time to helping the people to know God and to know his law so they would be a holy nation separated under God. Every three years, you know what, what else would happen in the land of Israel? Every three years, there would be a local tithe that was taken up. And the local tithe was used to support the Levites that lived within inside of their own cities. And it would also be used to support the fatherless, the widows, the foreigners, the people that had no way to take care of themselves. So every three years, he would require a tithe to take care of people inside of your own community. And by not paying their tithes... They were causing great suffering in the land. The storehouses were empty. The poor and the vulnerable and the fatherless, they were not having anything to eat and they were being forgotten about and they were being abandoned. I want you to understand that because I think it'll help you to understand what he's saying in verse nine even better. Look at what it says in verse nine. Ye are cursed with a curse for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. They weren't just robbing God. They were robbing other people. The reason why they were in the predicament that they were in was because they did not obey God. So can I tell you this morning, obedience is the key. Stop disobeying God. Obey him in every single area and aspect of your life. Be like Alana, okay? I'm gonna use her as an illustration. She's just looked up and she's like, oh no, I did not know this was coming. When we were dating, I'm just gonna confess a story to, on myself. I told this on Wednesday night. When we were dating, Man, I was a poor college student. Every single penny that I made had to go to paying bills, and I didn't feel like I had any left over. So in the midst of, uh, actually, we were engaged, and we're starting to talk about budgets. How many of you have done that when you're getting close to getting married? And, oh, we weren't on the same page on that either. <laughs> and we're having a lot of conversations. And then in the course of it, she starts asking me about my giving habits, and she found out that I was more or less just tipping God, not giving to God. And I'll tell you what, just right there on the spot, she said, if you don't get that right, we're not getting married. 
And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> but she's right. Hey, if we're not going to obey God, I'm not, I don't want to go in and set my whole entire family life up in an area that's going to be disobedient to God. I want God to bless me. Do you understand that God commands us to do things because he loves us and he cares about us, not because he wants to make our life more complicated and difficult. He wants us to trust him in all that we have. Just make up your mind. If God says it, that's what we're going to do. Obedience is key, and I love this. We obey God because he wants us to enjoy his blessings. Put me to the test. Enjoy his blessings. Look at what he says in verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. When you remember that the nation of Israel was an agricultural nation, opening the windows of heaven, pouring out rain, that was a blessing. That was something that caused great happiness and joy in the land. And God says, if you obey I'm going to open the windows of heaven. Your your barns are going to be full. In fact, they're going to be overflowing. Look what he also says in verses 11 and 12. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And I love verse 12. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. He's telling his people, I I want you to return to me. They're like, where shall we return? We're we're right here. And God's like, no, you're not. Your hearts are so from. If you return to me and if you do what I ask you to do, I have all of these blessings that I want to pour out on you. Start with the tithe. Start giving it to me and watch. I'll open the windows of heaven and I will bless you in such a way that all the nations of the world will look and say, that nation is blessed. That's a delightsome land. That's a place I want to visit. That's a place I want to live. Those are the lives I want to experience. That's what God wants to do. And I love what he says. He says, prove me now. You know, this is the only place in the entire Bible where God says, prove me, dare me. Put me to the test. Take your finances and put me to the test and see if what I'm saying is true or not. Maybe that's what some of you need. Maybe some of you, it's just not good enough to obey. Maybe some of you just need, like, I dare you to give. <laughs> How many of you respond to that, man? You get dared, and it's like, oh, I'm on. I'll do whatever. Essentially, that's what God, prove me now. Now, you might be sitting here thinking, and I got to just address this real quick. Some of you I know that know the Bible well are going to say, nowhere in the New Testament is the tithe commanded. And you're right. When you get to the New Testament, nowhere in the New Testament is the tithe commandment. Guess what? Nowhere in the New Testament is the tithe abolished either. And when we get to the New Testament, the issue is not how to get people to give an accepted minimum. It's how to unleash maximum generosity in every single area of our life. That's what the New Testament is all about. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, God says he loves a cheerful giver. God wants us to look at our lives and say, wow, you're the owner and creator of all things. You gave your life for me on the cross. You're my father, and and you want me to give, and you want me to unleash that in my life so that way you can use me, and that way you can bless me. Okay, God, I'll trust you. And it's not about a minimum. It's not about, oh, man, it's not 10%. Most of the time, people that are arguing about that, they're also arguing so that they don't have to give. And that's what it's not about. It's not about the accepted minimum. I love what also what it says. If you sow sparingly, guess what? You'll reap sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. And there's a verse in 2 Corinthians 9 that says, when we give cheerfully, that God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye have always having all sufficiency for all things may abound to every good work. That's talking about finances. And God wants to make all of his grace abound to you so that you will have sufficiency to meet the needs that come up and that arise. Also, I want you to understand, in the New Testament, the same type of things that God needed the tithe for in the Old Testament that he used it for is the true in the New Testament. Paul talks about taking care of the ministers and the teachers of God's word and to giving to a hired servant the labor that they're worthy of. He also talks about The fact that the offerings were used to take care of the fatherless and the widows and the foreigners and the poor that are inside of your community. He also talks about the fact that he was asking for offerings to go towards missions work and planning churches. And can I tell you this morning, I'm proud of our church. I'm proud of you. 
Y'all give, I, I was just sitting up there this morning, I was walking, I'm praying, and it just started hitting me, all these different things. Just this past week, our school and our church worked together, and our elementary kids, just a few select classes, brought enough food in that they gave of their own money, many of these kids, that we were able to pack 59 Thanksgiving meals and get them prepared that are going to go to some needy families right here in Santa Rosa County. Will you praise the Lord for that this morning? Then I started thinking back to, you know, the, um, the baby bottles that we took up. Back at the beginning of October, we had the Sanctity of Life Sunday. And we were talking about the danger of Amendment 4. And praise God, that did not pass. I thank God for how he moved and he worked in that. Well, I got a letter just about two weeks ago from Life Options Clinic. And they thanked our church for giving over $4,600 at that time. I believe it's up over $5,000 now. We had several more bottles come in since then. And it was the largest offering that they had received up to date. Will you praise the Lord for that this morning? <laughs> And then I started thinking about missions, and I started thinking about the Philippines Heritage Project and the $100,000 we're going to send to build a transition home for children that have, that have no family. And when they age out at 18, they now have a place to stay so they can get set up for the future so that they can set their hope in God. And the $215,000 that we give above and beyond our tithes to send to missionaries all around the world, will you praise the Lord for that this morning? I started thinking about our Christmas project that, that we're going to introduce Tuesday night. Come back to the praise service. We'll tell you all about that. And I could just go down the row, list after list of things that our church tries to do in this community to be able to meet needs. Don't rob yourself. Don't rob yourself. Number one, God wants to bless you. And when we trust him with our finances, he will bless but it also bless you by, by encouraging you of all the different things that you get to be a part of. And there's nothing more satisfying and fulfilling than knowing that you're meeting needs, knowing that you're making a difference, knowing that God allows us to be a part of what he's doing all around this world for his honor and for his glory. So put God to the test. That's number one. Set your hope in God. Secondly, get off the fence. Get off the fence. Look at verses 13 through 15. He says this. Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, what have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? You know what's happening here? God's on the, ta God's on the attack. He's, he's calling them out. Your words have been stout. Your words have been severe against me. You're going around and you're saying, it's vain to serve God. And God said, no, it's not vain to serve me. It's not vain at all. I already told you about the fact that, again, these people were doing on the outside everything that looked right. They're going through the worship rituals, and they look like they're doing things right, and yet God wasn't blessing them. And look at verse 15. And now we call the proud happy, yea, they that work wickedness are set up, yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. These people were so jaded. They were looking at the world around them, and they were saying, look how good they have it. And they're looking at all these. These people aren't going to church. These people aren't giving their money. These people aren't obeying these outdated rules that make life difficult in the Bible. They're looking around at, at the world around them and all the things that they're getting away from. And they're, they're saying, man, they look happy. Man, they look like God's blessing them. Everything's going well for them, and everything's going bad for me. Have you ever been there before, by the way? Have you ever gotten a bad attitude where you've just gotten jaded and you're like, man, everything's going good for everybody else and everything's going bad for me? See past the lies. See past the lies. Stop lying to yourself. It's not vain to serve God. It's vain to pretend to serve God. It's vain to go through the motions of serving God. It's vain to say all the right things on the outside, but at the same time, your heart is far from God. The root problem with God's people, that's who we're talking about here, God's people in the book of Malachi, their worship was dead. They did not honor God as father. They did not honor God as master. They weren't spending time in prayer. They weren't thanking God. They're accusing God. How could we get to that point where instead of we fall on our faces in overwhelming awe at God's goodness and his blessings on our lives, that we start accusing him of all of the ways he's not being good and he's not blessing us? They weren't seeking God for wisdom. 
They were 100% consumed with themselves. They didn't feel the greatness of God. They weren't consumed with other people being inspired to feel the greatness of God. They were selfish and they were self-centered. And here's the reality this morning. If you are jaded, okay, if you are having a hard time seeing anything positive, can I tell you to look inward before you look anywhere else and make sure that your vertical relationship with God is where it needs to be? Because until your heart, until your attitude is right, everything is going to be skewed. Everywhere you look, you'll find and you will see negativity. And that is not what God created us to be. Because of the cross, we should see his goodness. Because of the cross, we should let go of bitterness. Because of the cross, we should forgive. Because of the cross, we should be the most positive people alive on the face of the earth. So stop lying to yourself. And then stop believing that the wicked are prospering. Look at, verses, look at chapter 3, verse 18, and then chapter 4, verse 1. Then shall he return, okay? He's looking to the future. This is a prophet. And discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Stop believing that the wicked are prospering. It's easy to open our eyes and look around the world and say, man, it sure does feel and seem like they're winning. And it sure does feel like everything's going well for them and everything's going rough for us. Can I tell you that that is a lie? And even though God causes the sun to shine on the just and on the unjust, there is coming a day when the Lord, the God of judgment, is going to return. And when he does, I guarantee you, you want to be on the side of the righteous and you do not want to be on the side of the wicked. This morning as I was going about I, I, walking, I was just, I know this is a silly illustration, but I was thinking about the Harbaugh's. How many Michigan fans do we have in here? I know he left you high and dry, but one of the things that these coaches always said, I think, I think it came from their family, it was a family tradition, but they would always say, who's got it better than us? And then everybody would say, nobody. And I, in some ways, I in some ways, that could be a little prideful, okay? But in some ways also, I like the idea of just instilling how good we have it as a family, how good we have it as a group of people. But biblically speaking, I think it's good for us to remember who's got it better than us. You're a child of God. He's your savior. You have that covenant relationship with him. Nobody has it better than you do. Nobody has it better than I do. Nobody has it better than God's people. So stop believing the lies and stop living in defeat and look to the cross and see Jesus and get past that. See past the lies. Focus on the future. Look at verse 16. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. You know that God has a book of remembrance? God, God, by the way, he sees and knows and will remember all things. He doesn't need a book to remember. He can just remember anyway. But he uses this to speak to us in terms that we can understand. God has a book of remembrance. And you know what he sees? He sees everybody that fears the Lord. And he sees all of you that talk about his name on a regular basis. And he takes an account of that, and he's writing that down. He sees sees all the frivolous conversations, but that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about the frivolous conversations about the weather and sports, about what you like and don't like about your job or this week that's coming up or the church or whatever it is. Okay, we're not talking about conversations like that. God sees the conversations that you have with other people about what God is doing in your life. God sees the conversations that you have on your knees as you cry out to God in humility and ask him for his help and ask him for his mercy and ask him for his grace and his strength. God sees the conversations you have where you're burdened about other people and the people that you want to see saved. God sees the conversations you have about how can we do more for Christ? How can we reach more people? How can we make a bigger difference in this community? How can God use me? What are my next steps? That's what God sees. And it's high time as people get back to having serious conversations, not just frivolous conversations, but serious conversations about who he is and how great he is. And can I tell you, 
That's happening in our church. We started D groups a while back. We got 15 different D groups that are going on right now. And there are incredible stories and testimonies that are coming out of each one of them as people are getting into God's word and sharing their burdens and opening up. God's doing a work. And if you want to be in a D group, go to the app and sign up for one. We'll help you get in one. So here's the point. Focus on the future. God sees and remember those that fear him. And I love what he says in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 4, and I'm not going to read them. He says this, that one day when the Lord returns to destroy the wicked, he's the son of righteousness will arise, is what it says, with healing in his wings. Is there anybody here this morning that just feels really broken? I'll put my hand up. Man, when life gets busy, I get really broken. I start feeling like that. Man, when we just start running 90 to nothing, I just start getting just going in different directions. And I always say in our house, haste makes waste. When you start getting in a hurry, you know what you do? You start making a lot of mistakes. You start getting short and impatient and different things like that. Look, all I'm trying to say is I know I'm broken, but there's coming a day where the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings, and all of our brokenness is going to be healed. All of our brokenness is going to be taken care of, and we're not going to have to fight the fight any longer. We're just going to be able to be in his presence where there's fullness of joy and pleasure forevermore. And I love how he ends it in verse um, 2. He says that we will be set free like a calf out of the stall. I would not have personally used that illustration. I'm not a farmer. Okay, but like this is this is the Bible. I didn't write it. And he says like a cat. And all I could think of was my dog in the morning. When I wake up in the morning, my dog is so ready to go outside. I can't even get to the door. I'm trying to open the doorknob and he's got his wet nose right up there. I can barely even open it. He's so excited to get outside. And then the second that door opens up, man, he's just boom, gone. And he's just like the happiest dog in the entire world. You ever take your dog for a walk and it just is like, they got no cares in the world. They're just the happiest. I mean, they're just panting. I'm not going to show you what they look like, okay? But they're just like, they're just happy. They're free. Oh, to be like a dog. (laughs) Someday, that's what we're going to be. We're going to be free in his presence. Think about the future. Don't don't get your eyes on today. Don't get your eyes on the problems. Keep them fixed on God. He sees you that fear his name. He knows you that love him. He sees the conversations that you're having. And one day he will heal and he will remember and he will restore and he will make right. And what an awesome day that's going to be. I got one more point, but don't worry. It'll go quick. Here it is. Third action step. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is if we're going to set our hope in God, we're going to put God to the test. Secondly, we're going to get off the fence. We're not walking that middle ground anymore, man. We're seeing past the lies. We're thinking about the future. We are all in serving God. And last but not least, remember the law. Look at verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Remember the law is like saying, remember the... Remember the Titans. Okay, I got one. When you think of remember the what, what comes to your mind? Remember the Alamo. Thank you. There it is, okay? That's just where I go. I love Davy Crockett. I mean, when I was a kid, I used to watch that Disney Davy Crockett movie. Remember the Alamo. The Alamo. I said that weird. (laughs) Remember the Alamo. Nowadays, you might think of it in terms of like, never forget. Never forget 9-11. Never forget Pearl Harbor. Never forget D-Day. I'm trying to say there's certain things that happen in our collective history that we just will never forget. They are so monumental. They are so big and massive that they never get out of our collective memory. And you know what we do? We, we tell those stories to our kids and we pass them on. You know what he's saying here? Remember the law. Remember what happened in Horeb. Remember how God took you out of Egypt, out of bondage and slavery. Remember how God defeated the most powerful army in the world and swallowed them up in in the Red Sea. Remember how he fed you with manna. Remember how his visible presence descended on Mount Sinai. Remember how he gave you his word, his law, his commandments, because he loves you and they're good commandments and they're righteous judgments and they're so that we can live blessed and happy and holy lives. 
Remember the law. Remember God's word. Don't forget it. Write it on the corners of your house. Put it everywhere. Speak it when you get up in the morning. Tell it to your children at the dinner table, at the lunch table, in the car. Play and sing his praises. Remember the law and remember the word of God. And then here's how this book ends. And look for revival. I think this verse ends with, this book ends with a big surprise. You would expect remember the law, right? But then in verse 5, he says that he's going to send Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. He's going to send a prophet like Elijah who's going to come. And when Elijah starts preaching, look at verse 6. It says, And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. I forgot to tell the musicians when they could come out today, but if they're back there listening, they can come out right now. (laughs) And I want you to understand this morning, God wants us to look for revival. If you take all of the things that we talked about today, okay, set your hope on God. Put God to the test. Get off the fence. Here I am, God. I'm all in. I'm not going to live a life of of lifeless worship, and I'm not going to go through the the motions of serving you in vain. I'm all in. Remember the law of God, and guess what's going to happen? God will begin to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers, and all I can say in that is there's going to be a revival that takes place. There's going to be an incredible work of grace and mercy that God does that can only be attributed to him. Look for revival. You know, when you put God to the test, when you get off the fence, when you remember the law, families change because you're living for others and you're not living for yourselves. You know, the greatest thing in all the world that these parents can do for their children is to set their hope in God. And by the way, this isn't necessarily a guarantee. Y'all can start playing too, by the way. (laughs) This isn't necessarily a guarantee that everything's going to work out perfectly in your life. Ultimately, at the end of the day, we can still only control ourselves, right? I I can't control what my children do. I, I want them to do right, but they have a free will. The only person that I can control is me. And when I keep my focus where it needs to be, God's going to bless me. God's going to make me a delightsome land. It's going to make our home a delightsome home. Whether our kids are living for God or not, if if my relationship's right with God, if Alana's and my relationship is right with each other, and we're following the, the prescriptions that are prescribed, we will be right with God, and there will be peace, and there will be joy, and there will be his power, and there will be his presence. And God will bless. And you know what hopefully will happen? Our children will see that and they'll want the same thing. Or our neighbors will see that. Or our church family will see that. The point is this. When we're living for God, he wants to use you. And he wants to use me. And he wants us to be looking for that revival and believing that it can happen and that it can come and that God wants to do great things.